Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, and thanks to B&H, we are here in the home studios of Mr. Bob Mallory one more time. Bob is a Grammy-winning, platinum-selling uh, engineer. He is now working a lot with uh, Paste Magazine, doing a lot of their you know live multi-track sessions, and he's a great mixer and recorder in his own right. Thank you. And uh, we're going to be talking to Bob a little bit about best practices for the home studio. So, Bob. We've already talked a little bit about acoustic treatment. I want to ask you a bit more about monitoring, meaning speakers, headphones, also kind of your interface setup. Previously, you had some Yamaha NS10s up here on the monitor stands, and we kind of threw up some Mackies. Uh, how do you like each of these speakers? Why were you mixing on NS10s before? And how do you feel about the difference between the NS10s and these Mackies? I firmly believe that one of the biggest differences uh, when, I, when I'm mixing is using something that I'm familiar with. Mm. So the NS10s, number one, they're in almost every professional studio. Right. No, uh, number two, I've used them for, for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just comfortable with them. I know what they sound like. There's so many speakers that do sound much better and have a fuller range. Sure. Uh, I like them because I know them. Mm -hmm. So I have expectations for uh, what they're going to sound like, mm -hmm. for what my mix is are going to sound like what a kick drum or a snare or right. a vocal sounds like coming through the NS10s. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like a habit. Mm -hmm. Just sort of, you rely on it. Right. I rely on it just because I know I know it. So familiarity is pretty key. Once you get a set of speakers, if you just stick with them, you right. really get to know them inside and out. That's right. probably the biggest thing. You know, I, I listen to a lot of other music on them to reference, right. as well as having my mixes go to mastering. Mm -hmm. And then in like a, a very expensive, uh, very detail-oriented room, right. I've heard my mixes come through like speakers that you know are, are very expensive and, and very clear. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, after doing that many, many, many times, I know kind of like how to prep my mixes and what to expect, what how they're going to translate right. to, to a different room. Yeah. Well, one other thing I'll give you that's special about the Yamaha NS10s is that they don't have a lot of low frequency. Uh, and if you have a room where the low frequency is messy, you know, you're not gonna have a lot of messy low frequency. They probably barely put out anything below 100 hertz. And the other cool thing is that they're a non-ported design. Mm -hmm. So they don't have like this resonant one note bass kind of thing. They have a tight focused low end. You don't get a lot of low end, but uh, you can trust what's there. And you know that if you can hear your, your low end on those NS10s, anyone with a cheap, you know, small speaker system is going to hear right. that low end. Right. Yeah. And it's also good because if you have a bass instrument like kick drum or a bass guitar, uh, you know, sometimes if you're mixing on speakers that have a lot of bass, right. something like these Mackies, you might think that you have enough of it. Mm. It might not translate to an uh, iPhone or a laptop speaker yeah. or something like that. So... I think it's a little bit advantageous to, to use NS10s and, and make sure that you have low frequency instruments like the kick or the mm -hmm. bass guitar, uh, you know, that those tracks have enough uh, like high mids and, mm -hmm. and other information to speak when it when it's played back on right, the laptop. Right. So if you can make those elements and just the mix in general sound really good on a kind of tight, constrained set of speakers, they're going to sound really good anywhere. Right. Whereas speakers like this that sound really good, well, they might sound a little too good and you might not push things hard enough, maybe. Right. Yeah. Right. One of the problems, though, is they don't make those NS10s anymore. That's so true. for people at home who want to try something that's not full range and really detailed like this, but a, um, a kind of restricted mixing speaker, I know there's a couple of things. I think the uh, Aventone is making a, a recreation of kind of the Oritone. Mm -hmm. I think Oritone is back in business uh, making speakers. And then there's the Barentone by Behringer. And mm -hmm. these are much smaller, like the little yeah. three and a half inch speakers. And I know a lot of mixers like those for a lot of the same reasons as the NS10. Yeah, I've meant to uh, pick some up. Yeah. I kind of wanted to do a mono version of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Sure, sure. Uh, now, if you were going to recommend a full range speaker for someone mm -hmm. to have in their mixing studio so they can hear all that low end and all that top end detail, are there any speakers that you'd recommend to people kind of thrown in their own home studio? Uh, at Pace, I have a pair of the KRKs. Right. Uh, they have different series. Mm -hmm. I have the VXT8s. Uh, they're about the a little bit larger than these Mackies here. Mm -hmm. they, they sound good. They have a lot more low end. Sure. 
I like the punch that comes off of them. Right. People like the the bands who come through seem to respond really well to them. Right, right. Uh, so I really like those KRKs. Sure. One of the things uh, that I've been really impressed by, I have some uh, Adams at home, uh, and the Adam A5X is not expensive at all. Mm. But they go surprisingly deep. They've got a pretty flat but detailed top end. I'm liking those a lot. And they're a little smooth and dark, which is good for me. I tend to mix dark. Mm. And having a speaker that's not too bright encourages me to push the top end a little bit. I know that another thing a lot of people really like, fairly affordable, are Dyn Audios. And they just came out with some cheaper ones, the LYD range. And to me, those are a little kind of tighter and more articulate than the Atoms. And I think something like that's great. I know that Yamaha is now making, I think it's like an HS series, a new white cone mm -hmm. speaker that's like, uh, looks like the NS10s. I don't think it sounds a lot like the mm -hmm. NS10s. It goes deeper, no. it's a lot brighter on top. I haven't heard them yet, but uh, I'm sure I'll check them out at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So talk to us a little bit about headphones, because I think a lot of people in home studios are going to end up doing a lot of work on headphones. Um, for tracking, I mean, I'd probably recommend closed back headphones, but for mixing, I think open back headphones often work better. Do you have any opinions on headphones for the studio? Yeah, I concur with you. Mm -hmm. Open back uh, sounds much more natural. Mm -hmm. And for long hours mixing, it definitely just feels better on my ears. Right, right. Uh, I don't feel like my ears are getting punched by a boxer all day long. <laughs> are uh, there any open backs that you really like? Yeah. Uh, I'm a fan of two, and I kind of go back and forth between the two. The Grados, a company out of Brooklyn, mm -hmm. make uh, fantastic headphones. Mm -hmm. So much detail. Uh, really great for balancing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fantastic. Uh, the Sennheiser HD 600s, sure. I use those. Uh, to me, those are a good uh, comparison to the NS10s. Mm -hmm. The HD 600s let me hear a little bit more low end mm -hmm. in my home that uh, the NS10s don't provide. Right. Uh, and so I feel when my mixes go off to mastering, after tweaking the low end with the HD 600s, yeah. I'm much more confident uh, that my bass will be exactly where I want it to be. Gotcha. In the mix. Yeah, those uh, Sennheiser HD 600s and the HD 650s and the Grados, it's open back headphones. They do go deeper, I think, uh, flatter than a lot of closed back headphones do. The one problem I would say about, well, two problems maybe. First, we're talking about headphones that are hundreds of dollars, right? Yeah. And you can get a lot of bleed, I think, if you're tracking off of the open back. So it's probably right. good to have some closed backs around for tracking. Yeah. And if people are looking for open backs that are a little more affordable, I'd say uh, one option that's been a long time classic is the AKG K240 right. S. I think those are closer to the $100 range. And you know, there's so many options less expensive than that these days too. But that's a, another standby if you want to spend 100 instead of hundreds. Right, you know? yeah. right. The, the Sony 7506s right. are great closed back headphones. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a couple of those on the side yeah. for if I'm doing an overdub, especially vocals or acoustic guitar. Right. Uh, the performer can wear those. I don't have to worry about bleed. Mm -hmm. uh, they like sound pleasing to listen to. Mm -hmm. I think they're tiring to mix on for yeah. hours and hours. Uh, well, they're really bright and tight and loud headphones. So right. for me, if I was mixing on those, I'd have to be like, all right, did I make things sound really, really annoyingly bright? Okay, I know the mix is done. Yeah. But it's great for tracking through because they sound exciting. Like you said, you get the lack of bleed. Some others, I think, uh, Sennheiser HD 280s, I think a lot of people are using these days. Yep. Uh, there are some Audio Technicas uh, that people are really liking. The ATH series. Yeah. So either of those are, are pretty good. Now, since we're talking about headphones, mixes for you know an artist you're working with, can you tell us a little bit about your monitoring control system? What did you pick to be able to kind of route uh, things to your speakers, to your headphones? Are there any considerations that people need to think about when they're doing monitor control or interfaces? Right. Um, a few options. You want something with that can handle multiple speakers. Mm -hmm. So do you have two pairs of speakers? Do you have three pairs? Do you have a sub that you want to turn on and off? Mm -hmm. uh, also, do you have different sources? Maybe one source is just your computer output and you want to be able to volume match that with your Pro Tools mix or your Logic mix coming uh, out of your speakers, out of your interface. So I have the Dangerous Monitor ST. Mm -hmm. uh, it can handle multiple speakers. It can handle a sub. It can handle like a regular consumer level, you know, eighth inch jack going into right. it. I can set the volume of that to be at a comparative level mm -hmm. with my mix. 
Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of things. The, the dangerous is a really nice one, but I think if people aren't ready to spend that much yet, there's the Persona Central Station. Yep. It's like the Mackie Big Knob. Uh, so there's other options out there. One of the cool things with this is you got, I think, three different speakers that you can choose between. So we can get your full ranges up here. We can yep. get your NS10s over there for some like acoustic mono coming yep. at you from the side. And then we could throw in that Oritone later and see uh, you got all these options to mix on. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. perfect. And then do you have separate headphone mixes coming off of this? Uh, how do you handle that? The Dangerous only has one headphone output. Mm -hmm. It's got a headphone volume knob, of course. Yeah. You can also uh, control how much of the talkback is going to it. So in a more conventional, professional studio environment, uh, where you're here in the control room and the artist is somewhere else, it's pretty important to have like a separate mix for the artist and a separate mix for you. Do you ever do something like that in this small room, or uh, how does it work like that? Yeah. the. Uh, I think the, the worst thing that happened to me over years of like also having a home studio, you know, maybe you only have one or two headphone outputs, mm -hmm. or maybe you only have one, and so you buy a Y cable, <laughs> and you're trying to listen to that while the singer is trying to sing over the band, and they need to hear more of themselves and more of themselves, and suddenly like you're sharing the same volume knob, mm -hmm. and uh, they're jacked up, and you just feel like your eardrums are bleeding. <laughs> right. Uh, it's terrible. So a monitor control system where you can have two separate headphone mixes is pretty ideal, even if yeah. you're just in a small space like this. Right. The Dangerous Monitor ST only has one headphone output, mm -hmm. so normally I just use that for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I have another uh, device that has some headphone outputs that I just run the extra signal to. I mult it on the patch bay. Mm -hmm. uh, I know not everybody at home will have a patch bay, <laughs> right. but uh, maybe you can use outputs three and four yeah. from your interface to send to some other kind of device. I actually just have like an old school cassette deck mm -hmm. and that's got an uh, input and volume knob. Oh, so you're using that as the headphone so amp. So I use that as a headphone right. amp for whoever the performer is. Right. But for, I think uh, people at home, if they look at something like the Persona Central Station, I think it has some solutions like that built in. But you could do exactly what you're talking about, have one monitoring set up for yourself and then a headphone amp set up separately for the player, and right. you just come out of extra outputs. If you have an interface that does more than two channels out, you come out outputs one and two for you, mm -hmm. come out outputs three and four into a headphone amp for them, and you got two separate mixes, and you can control that off uh, aux ends and Pro Tools, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's perfect. I found this way that worked for me, mm -hmm. and so I just never changed it. It's a little unconventional, but uh, the tape the tape deck has uh, V meters on it. Oh, cool. So I just turn it on, it looks cool, Yeah, and uh, that, Call it, I call it a day. Hey, when things look cool, they sound better. Totally. All right. Well, thanks again for taking the time to, uh, to hang out. My pleasure. And uh, we're going to do maybe one more video on mic techniques and mic lockers for the home studio. So cool. I hope folks stick around for that. Uh, you stick around. And we'll talk a little bit more about Sounds that. Sounds good. All right. Thanks again for hanging out with us. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop with the producer engineer Bob Mallory at his home studios. Thanks to B&H, we're doing a three-part series on best practices for the home studio. Hope you've enjoyed this one. Please check out the other two on mic techniques and mic lockers for the home studio and acoustic treatment for the home studio. See you next time.